You say, and I quote, predictably the mere mention of what of white acceptability has been shown to prompt blowback, especially but not always from individuals who classify themselves as white. White men have been shown to get disproportionately angry at the mm-hmm. onset of conversations about whiteness, and white women have been shown to often cry, mm-hmm. prompting any nearby white men to get concerned or even angry in their efforts to, perhaps, ride to the rescue. <laughs> The general term scholars use to describe these kinds of especially negative interactions with an examination of white privilege is fragility, and fragile behavior can range from attitudes of indignation or evasion to outright hostility and violence. Mm -hmm. So that's a a couple of different scholars talking at once. The first uh, one I'll pull on is um, Nakayama and Kryzek, and they have an article they wrote in 1994 called Strategic Whiteness that you, most people can find for free online. Hard to read. Quarterly journalist speech, not nice, but it's packed with peanuts, I say. If you can make it simpler and not get not lose anything in the article, you're famous as far as scholarship is concerned. Go for it. But their article, we read it in my class. It's pretty straightforward. And one of the, the questions that they tracked was just what happens when we ask people if they are white? What does that mean? And um, they found six different kinds of responses. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. One of them, it's just a color. It's just what color I am is another one. Uh, it's a nationality. It means I'm from Ireland, from Canada, from the United States. Um, it's a couple of different things that they list. There's six of them. And when they did this study and they put it out, they're like, here's our research and here's how we did it. And here are our findings. And since then, the... Google Scholar thing is like thousands of people have looked at this article and it replicates really, really well across space and through time in terms of the one thing that we take away is that the six forms are fairly robust and none of them want to look at whiteness. They are all dodging. They're all evading. They're all saying somehow let's not talk about what it actually means. And at some point in the class, someone's like, well, what does it mean? And we can talk about those histories of privilege and, you know, you know, it would mean talking about the KKK. It would mean talking about my wife's family in Norway. It would, you know, but that's not all it would mean. There's a big conversation there. But when the six ways that we respond are all some kind of a dodge, that is interesting. That tells us something. Um, one of the, the most robust responses they, they got was, I'm not playing. I'm not playing, a rejection. And they said that this comes in two forms, that particularly men seem to get angry and women cry. And that particular thread of that study has been pulled on by many people since. And a big part of understanding toxic masculinity, hegemonic masculinity, also ideal femininity and what it means to be either historically in our storytelling and the ways that we embody these stories is knowing that men are told that they're allowed to get angry and to yell and to shout and to... I have this thing I'm talking about now called the hegemonic masculinity three-step, or the aggrieved hegemonic masculinity three-step. I'm bad at naming things. A man is aggrieved. A man does violence. We do not blame the man for violence. We see this in all sorts of different forms, and it is intrinsically a masculine behavior, according to folks like Jackson Katz and Michael Kimmel. There's legacies of these stories. It's kind of John Wayne. He's not a fighter until why I oughta, and then he's going to knock your block off. Uh, and But then, nope, not his fault, though. He typically is not a fighter. He only fought because of that one time. There's a legacy, too, of ideal femininity. And um, here, Dr. Califel's work comes back, because in her writing on monstrosity, uh, she and several scholars that she detailed that talk about Nakayama and Kryzek and also others realize that that when white women cry, that is a very powerful performance. That's an incredibly powerful performance that evokes certain kinds of behavior. The whole flap about Karens and things like that right now is evoking a lot of this. And um, this is, doesn't mean it's not okay for women to cry and for men to get angry. We're not saying any of those things. We're just saying it's really weird that if I ask a room full of people what does it mean to be white, predictably since at least 1990, and we would argue before, we're going to get these results. And as a white guy, I was pissed when I read that because I read this in college and I was pissed and I saw the result. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm angry. Wait, that's me in the research. I'm in the, I'm doing the thing that the research says I'm doing. And right there, I remember making a choice to be like, well, I don't want to do that. 
I don't, why am I getting angry? What am I angry about? And I started really asking those hard questions about where that anger came from and what am I trying to protect and what am I upset about? And there's so much research on how to engage whiteness critically, you know, but that's what that's pulling on is to be like, and I'll say that I've seen this too. And my, my, my colleagues just incidentally, allegorically as a debate coach, weaker argument, but I've taught for a while in front of a lot of people. I've taught in Northern California. I've taught in Denver, Colorado. I taught in Eugene, Oregon, uh, Kennewick, Washington, Vancouver, Washington. I've moved all over the place at public schools, at private schools, at two-year schools. I coached at a uh, maximum security prison once. And whiteness conversations prompt fragile responses. This speaks to my experience. It speaks to my colleagues' experience. It's in the research one thing I try to say more and more and more is that in the book I say, this means I'm not intrinsically a terrible person. It means I have learned some things that I need to think about. And um, part of me looking at this media is trying to understand that. The the aspect of white women crying, you don't attribute that any of that to it just being a woman crying? That if you were to see a woman <laughs> crying, you would be inclined yeah. to... Go well, see what's going on. If you engage the research, and, and Califel's really good at this, she's like, if it's a Latino woman, she doesn't get treated the same way. If it's a black woman, she doesn't get treated the same way. If it's an indigenous woman, she doesn't get treated the same way. The, the women's tears prompt racialized responses. This, too, is pretty robust. And I think there it's a good example of where it's like, what is the objective question of at which point do people cry? Okay, fine. What does it mean to cry? Who can cry and when and how? Those are very important power questions that no one's sitting around enforcing the rules. No one's like, ha, 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 we'll make it so only white women can cry. That's not how it works. But there are definitely, definitely, and we know it because it's in our, our legal documents, it's in our religious documents, it's, it's everywhere we look. There's legacies of saying that, that certain performances are different than other performances and that certain ways of being are different than other ways of being. When you look at just the differences between masculinity and femininity, this is really, really important. Like, can, can men cry? You know, how come more men aren't crying? One of the questions I ask people that watch hip-hop videos is, has anyone seen Eminem roll around on a floor? I've never seen Eminem roll around on a floor. Most women hip-hop artists, they spend a lot of time rolling on floors. I've seen that happen. Why isn't Eminem rolling on floors? What's I didn't know on? anybody was rolling around on floors. Yeah, it's, it's a posture that you see in a particular era of hip-hop of that time, and this is coming from uh, gender, race, and class in the media, the Heinz text, that's like women position themselves provocatively and sexually, men position themselves in positions of power and authority. That is both, like who we are, I guess, because we see it everywhere, but also just weird. Like th those are just birds flapping in the woods. And the question is, why are they flapping that way? And why do we position ourselves that way? And I think that when it comes to white tears in particular, um, the research is sufficient for me to say that there's a meaningful difference there. And in that's, response. Yeah. In, in terms of how we respond to those tears. Like we will overlook black tears a lot. That research is pretty robust where it's like when black people cry, we tend to say they're either overreacting or we say they're probably responsible for it somehow, or we'll say it's none of my business. I don't know that person and it's none of my business. Um, you get different political responses depending on who's crying and when. Do you think any of that is changing? Because you do have that persona of the white Karen now mm -hmm. where there's this white woman overreacting and people just <laughs> right. kind of brush it off. Well, what uh, feminist scholars say is that uh, one of the things that, that scholarship is supposed to do is articulate something. And naming something a Karen is a good example of articulation. Like toxic masculinity was not a thing until someone described it. And when they describe it and they give us the recipe, then I can be like, I don't want to be that person anymore. Thank you, critical consciousness, for helping me you know, look at my life and say, I don't want to do this, 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 or this. 